Okay, so welcome back to our second seminar in our inaugural International Steenbach Lectureship. So for those of you who weren't here yesterday, I'll just quickly uh, reintroduce Professor Thomas Langer from uh, the University of Cologne in Germany. And so Thomas is a world leader in mitochondrial biology, and especially as they relate to proteases. So yesterday we heard a fascinating talk about a pair of proteases in mitochondria that uh, regulate fusion and fission in response to stress, in response to changing metabolic conditions that had some pretty profound implications on whole organismal physiology. And today, showing uh, the eclectic nature of his work, uh, will stay rooted in proteases, I believe, but really a, a pivoted to a very different topic uh, and about membrane organization and in lipid trafficking. So how do you actually move hydrophobic molecules from different membranes throughout the cell, something that's, uh, I think, largely untapped and uh, through mechanistic biochemistry that uh, Tomas is really helping us understand. So uh, with that, please welcome again uh, our inaugural Steenbach, uh, International Steenbach Lecture, Professor Thomas Langer. And uh, thank you for coming again. As Dave pointed out today, actually I will talk a little bit about something, a different topic that is of interest in our lab, but which of course still concerns uh, our pet organelle, and these are the mitochondria. Uh, uh, yeah, and today, as you will, uh, we will, I will introduce you a bit into uh, our work on this lipid trafficking within this organelle. Now, actually, I would like to start out with a very general question, or to, uh, and that is, how do uh, uh, cell membranes maintain their lipid composition. And this is actually something that is really poorly understood, I think broadly poorly understood, but it's also very important to understand because a defined lipid composition is of course important for the function of any cellular membrane and the proteins that reside in this membrane. And that is of course also true for mitochondrial membrane, just as an example. And this is a, a lipidomics analysis of mitochondrial membranes in yeast. And they have a very defined lipid composition like any other cellular membrane. And that is very dis important for the function and integrity of mitochondria. If you disturb it, mitochondria uh, mitochondrial integ functional integrity is also disturbed. I mean, what I would like to highlight here is that the lipid composition is common to other cellular membrane in that PE, phosphatidyl ethanolamine, and PC are very abundant phospholipids in mitochondrial membranes, but mitochondrial membranes are distinct from all other eukaryotic membranes in that they have a phosphodiglycerophospholipid, cardiolipin, you see here the structure, that is actually uh, synthesized within mitochondria and that is they share with, with bacteria. So this is a typical bacterial derived lipid and it's characteristic for mitochondrial membranes, in particular the mitochondrial inner membrane, but it also seems to be pre present in the mitochondrial outer membrane. Now cardiolipin is a, a specific lipid because so-called non-bilayer lipids, so it forms hexagonal phases in vitro, so if you uh, reconstitute liposomes in vitro and have cardiolipin in them, in them there's not a it doesn't arrange in, lip, in, in bilayers, but forms these so-called hexagonal phases. And in vivo, there are many functions associated with cardiolipid that all have to do with membrane fluidity, kind of uh, membrane fusion and fission, because this is a specific function of these non-bilayer lipids. Now, in other cellular membranes that do not contain cardiolipin, another phospholipid is uh, fulfilling this function, this is phosphatidyl ethanolamine. So we have here phosphatidyl ethanolamine and cardiolipin, both known bilayer lipids, and they basically are thought to help membrane reshaping processes in a broad sense. Now, cardiolipin is synthesized within mitochondria. There's an enzymatic cascade that resides in the mitochondrial inner membrane. I don't want to go into any detail here. These are just the names of the yeast enzymes. Uh, and this uh, results then in the formation of a, a mature cardiolipin molecule, and then there's some so-called cardiolipin remodeling occurring, which basically as a consequence of this remodeling, the cardiolipin molecules all have the same uh, acyl chains or symmetric molecules. Huh? And this all occurs in the mitochondrial inner membrane before redistribution between the membrane, membranes occurs. Now the synthesis of this uh, cardiolipin starts from a precursor phospholipid, which is phosphatidic acid, and this precursor lipid is imported from the endoplasmatic reticulum. 
And in fact, the endoplasmatic reticulum, as you may be aware of, is the major site of, or I should say, the site of phospholipid synthesis, of lipid synthesis in the cell. And if this complex uh, diagram should just highlight that you know, many lipids, phospholipids, are synthesized in the ER and then redistributed to different cellular organelles, including the mitochondria. Hmm? Now, for instance, phosphatidic acid, which is somewhere here, is then is imported from the ER and converted into cardiolipin. But there are also other phospholipids must be imported into the, uh, into the mitochondria to preserve the mitochondrial lipid composition. But of course, there's also uh, a lot of uh, lipid exchange with other cellular organelles that basically uh, receive lipids synthesized in the ER. Now, the way the field is thinking of lipid trafficking is basically summarized in this cartoon, which says there are different ways and we do not understand much about it. Uh, basically, what you see, what, is just, what I just would like to point out here is that the spontaneous transport of phospholipid is not really occurring easily, simply for biophysical reasons or bioenergetic reasons. So it's very difficult to remove a hydrophobic lipid out of a bilayer. So there is no evidence that this is of any relevance in vivo, even at sites where two membranes are in close contact. However, these sites are thought to be important for lipid trafficking that is mediated by specialized proteins, so-called lipid transfer proteins, that pick up lipids from one bilayer and transport them uh, then to another bilayer. And this is actually appears often to occur at membrane contact sites. Of course, a very dominant way of transporting lipids in the cell is via vesicular transport and we have the whole secretory pathways and this actually allows reshuffling of lipids between different cellular compartments. However, the connection, so the mitochondria are not connected to the secretory pathway. There are some recent findings from mainly from Heidi McBride's lab uh, at McGill that there are mitochondria derived vesicles but they have not been linked to lipid trafficking so far at least. So, it was really unclear up to a few years ago how mitochondria receive their lipids and how lipids are redistributed within mitochondria. Now, how did we get into this? Maybe you may remember if you have been here yesterday, my lab is interested in mitochondrial proteases and that's actually not directly linked to it. And for a long time, although we were working on membrane-bound proteases, we didn't think much about lipids, I have to admit. However, we got interested in a protein that we now consider as a so membrane scaffold in the mitochondrial inner membrane, and these are prohibitins. Because we identified these proteins in a proteomic approach as a binding partner of one of our pet proteases, which is the MAAA protease. It's an ATP dependent protease in the inner membrane. It's not important for the uh, talk today. Now this protease basically forms large assembly of about 200 me uh, 2 megadalton in the mitochondrial inner membrane with these prohibitins. And these are highly conserved proteins. You find them in all eukaryotic cells, highly conserved. There are always two members of this family, PHP1 and PHP2, uh, in, in the cells. And they form large complexes in the mitochondrial inner membrane. And we purified them uh, in some years ago now from the yeast and some single particle EM analysis combined with cross-linking studies suggested that they, these uh, prohibitin subunits form large rings in the mitochondrial inner membrane that have a diameter of about 20 to uh, 25 nanometer. And this suggested to us already that this may be a kind of a scaffold membrane organizing protein in the mitochondrial inner membranes and multiple copies of PHP1 and PHP2 form these uh, form this ring-like structure. I should say that prohibitins themselves are highly conserved, but they are also part of a even more distributed protein family that is called the SPFH family. They all share a domain, common domain here in this part, have the same topology in the inner membrane and are now thought actually to form similar structures in other cellular membranes. So we may look here at a conserved family of membrane organizing proteins present in different cellular membranes, but prohibitins we believe are mainly or exclusively present in the mitochondrial inner membrane. Now, we, what do you do to really define the, the, the function of such a protein? We took in my lab actually two approaches. Huh? And one was more similar to what I said yesterday. We made 
uh, knockout, uh, generated knockout mice for one of these prohibiting subunits, prohibiting two, and deleted them in the mouse, found that this is embryonic lethal, so it's a really important function in mitochondria. But when we then looked at tissue-specific knockouts in the various tissues over the year, it turns out that in all tissues this has a very devastating effect. Hmm? So that by itself, we could talk about it, so we looked in the brain or in the cardiomyocytes or in beta cells. In all cases, we have a very severe phenotype. And as a kind of a recap to my talk yesterday, it turns out that an impaired mitochondrial fusion due to the stress-induced processing of this long OPA1 form, spy OMA1, is actually the cause of cell death in these, in these models. Huh? So these are all examples by the loss of prohibitins we activate OMA1 and this uh, results in stress-induced processing. Now this actually fostered us to look at this in more detail, and I told you the story yesterday, but, and it also told us a bit what the physiological consequences or, of a loss of the scaffold protein is, but it really didn't tell us much what the molecular function of this protein is. And that's not so easy to answer if you think of a scaffold protein that doesn't have a, uh, uh, enzymatic activity. So therefore we also took a, in parallel, a, a different approach and used yeast and yeast genetics to basically look for qi and were puzzled from the very beginning that in contrast to the mammalian system where the loss of prohibitins was essential, the loss of prohibitins in yeast had no obvious phenotype. Huh? So that was really puzzling to us. And therefore we did a so-called synthetic genetic array where we looked basically in, in, at genes that genetically interact with prohibitins and that are essential in, the, in prohibitin deficient cells. Huh? So if there are redundant functions of these two genes, maybe we learn something about uh, the function of the prohibitins. Now in this screen that Christoph Osman, a, a former PhD student in the lab, uh, performed, he came up with 35 genes that he named CHAP genes for genetic interactions with prohibitins, whatever. Uh, and we, I have to say, we stared at this list for at least a year and tried to make sense out of it. Uh, was not so, it, was, it, didn't seem random, it didn't seem random, so they were functional classes, but we didn't really understand what this all means until he did another screen on top of that. I don't want to go in, into that. That actually uh, led us to note that all of, the muta all of the genes that basically are essential in prohibiting deficient yeast cells affect in one way or the other the accumulation of phospholipids, in particular the uh, phospholipids phosphatidyl ethanolamine and cardiolipin. These are these non-hexagonal uh, type, or non-bilayer type lipids in the mitochondrial membrane. So all of the genes, or the, most of the genes that we identified in these screens affected in one way or the other the accumulation of PE and cardiolipin. Huh? And uh, Miriam Greenberg labs have shown before that also the common uh, loss of both phospholipids is lethal in yeast. So we have here an uh, intimate crosstalk between prohibiting genes with phosphatidyl ethanol, I mean, uh, phosphatidyl ethanol amine accumulation and cardiolipin accumulation. And that was the moment when my labs got interested in phospholipids. Huh? Uh, I still blame uh, Christoph for that still, till now, <laughs> because it's a difficult topic. Uh, Anyway, this, uh, this uh, work basically read, uh, led us to propose a model how prohibitins work as membrane scaffolds. So we think they are membrane organizers that form these large rings in the membrane and recruit specific proteins to specific sites. So there are functional domains in the membrane that are defined by a Def, let's say a defined protein complement, and we did in the meantime some proteomic studies in, uh, in mammalian cells and have, a, a good, I think, a rather fair understanding which kind of proteins are there at these scaffolds. But based on our yeast studies, we also think that they may affect the asymmetric distribution of specific phospholipids in the inner membrane and may basically enrich domains of in the inner membrane of uh, lipids like PE or cardiolipin. Hmm? So in that sense, they define functional domains in the inner membrane that have a defined protein and lipid composition. I should say this is just a model, despite all the work. And uh, an alternative model that is not completely different, but a bit different, is shown here on the right side. Keep in mind that the mitochondrial inner membrane is highly protein rich. Hmm? People estimate up to 80% of this membrane are proteins. So maybe it's very important for certain functions uh, like fusion, for instance, or yeah, 
uh, to have protein-free lipid patches in the inner membrane. So it could be that these scaffold proteins actually do the reverse, have a kind of fence-like function, and keep the proteins from specific spots, allowing basically the formation or maintaining these lipid free, uh, protein-free lipid patches in the mitochondrial inner membrane, preserving specific functions. So this is the way how we think of that, uh, uh, and we try to basically clarify the, the, the mode of action in more detail. Now another outcome of this genetic screen or this work in yeast that we did is that we now all of a sudden had a, a, a set of genes in hand that were linked to the accumulation of PE and cardiolipin. And I mean, we looked then in the literature, what could these genes do? And I have to say, I was really surprised to, uh, to see how little is understood. So with many open reading frames that we really didn't know what they do. For some of them, we have learned that in the meantime. So we decided to look at these genes in a bit more detail because they apparently affect the accumulation of PE in, uh, and cardiolipin in, more, uh, in mitochondria in some, one way or the other. Now, there's always an important decision how to pick a gene to look at it in more detail. In this case, it was, however, very easy because I had actually two students in the lab. One did this genetic screen that I just described to you, and then I had another one who basically did a quantitative mass spec approach uh, looking at potential substrate of the IAAA protease YME1 that you may remember from yesterday's talk, which is an ATP-dependent protease that resides in the mitochondrial inner membrane. This was Tanya Engman at the time, another PhD student. And she did this quantitative, quantitative proteomics and actually also identified two proteins that the corresponding genes were identifying Christoph C's gene. And that was somehow obvious that this attracted our attention. Uh, and so though we looked at those in more detail. Now it turns out that these proteins are part of a highly conserved protein family. All of these proteins in the meantime have been localized to the mitochondrial inter intermembrane space. In yeast there are three members, UPS1, UPS3, uh, two UPS3, and in mammals there are also three members, Preli1, Slomo1, and Slomo2. So that's a highly conserved family of proteins residing in the intermembrane space. And Christoph, and then another Christoph, who was another PhD student in the lab, Christoph Potting, actually uh, looked at this more uh, in detail using some biochemistry to characterize these proteins. And it turns out that these proteins are highly unstable, UPS1 and UPS2, and are constantly degraded by proteases that reside in the mitochondrial inner membrane. This is this YME1 protease. Here we look in yeast. Uh, we constantly degrade these proteins, so the steady state level of these proteins is very, very low. And they are only stabilized upon a, a formation of heterodimeric complexes with a common binding partner that is termed MDM35. This is a CX9C protein, which uh, basically, and we think that this is important for the import of these two proteins into the membrane and then forming these heterodimeric complexes. So we have this situation that we have two proteins, part of uh, heterodimeric complexes, so only upon heterodimerization these proteins are stable and protect against, uh, protected against degradation. The steady state level is very low, we hardly detect them by western blot depending on the antibody that we have, but when we delete these genes there seem to be a lipid specific effect. UPS1 deletion affects the accumulation of cardiolipin in mitochondrial membranes, whereas UPS2 deletion affected the accumulation of PE in the mitochondrial membranes. Now, uh, we of course wanted to understand this in more detail and started to look in more detail at UPS1. Hmm? So, uh, Matthias Haag and at, at the time did the lipidomics analysis by mass spectrometry and basically looked at phospholipids in yeast strains lacking, uh, lacking UPS1. And what he observed was that we saw the uh, reduced reduction of cardiolipin, but what may, was maybe more informative to us was the fact that he saw the accumulation of phosphatidic acid in these mitochondrial membranes uh, isolated from mitochondria lacking UPS1. So we have the accumulation of phosphatidic acid and reduced cardiolipin levels. Now, when you look at the enzymatic cascade that I just showed you before that resides in the inner membrane, phosphatidic acid is the precursor form that accumulates. Cardiolipin is, of course, the product. So UPS1 MDM35 is an inner, uh, intermembrane space protein, soluble intermembrane space protein. So it was obvious to speculate that maybe for, uh, uh, UPS1 has anything to do with the 
trafficking of U uh, phosphatidic acid to the inner membrane to basically allow its conversion into cardiolipin. Huh? I think it was an uh, obvious guess simply from the topology of these proteins together combined with this lipidomic data and we did some genetic, yeah, we supported this model actually with some genetic data. I don't want to go into, into it. Now to, to basically look at this in more directly, uh, we basically, or Takashi Tatsuta, and this I have to say, we were at that time all new assays in the lab, set up a lipid transfer assay in vitro. And as I'm not sure whether you are all aware with the type of these assays that are used in the lipid trafficking field quite extensively, I just wanted to introduce it to you uh, very briefly. So what you do here, you basically generate donor and acceptor liposomes that differ in their lipid composition. So the donor liposomes have the Lip contain the phospholipids that you are suspecting to be transported. The acceptor liposomes are free of them, uh, free uh, with them. You label them differently so that you can also uh, distinguish them by their fluorescence. And most importantly, you load one type of the lipid, in this case with, it, with the donor liposomes, with sucrose to make them uh, heavier. And this allows then after doing this reaction, when you then incubate these two li types of liposomes with your protein, and let them incubate if to, uh, to allow transfer. Then you can later, in a flotation gradient, separate these liposomes again. Huh? And so we basically separated these liposomes again and then determined uh, the lipid composition of the acceptor liposomes. And any of these lipids that we find then in the acceptor liposomes must have been transported by this lipid transfer protein. Huh? That's the basic principle of this. There are, of course, variations of this assay. Now, doing that, when Takashi did this, the result was really striking because when he looked at the different types of phospholipids, only one phospholipid uh, was efficiently transferred, and this is phosphatidic acid. And this showed us, with, together with other experiments, that UPS1, MDM35, are, uh, are able to transfer phospholipids in vitro from one liposome, uh, phosphatidic acid from one liposome to another liposome. Huh? So, uh, UPS1 and MDM35 seem to be lipid transfer proteins huh, for phosphatidic acid. And we looked at this in more detail, and this is the scheme we came up with, how these UPS1 and MDM35 proteins actually transfer phosphatidic acid. Now, UPS1 picks up a P a PA molecule at the inner leaflet of the outer membrane, and upon assembly with MDM35, it is stabilized, and it is basically, we think, stabilized in a transport competent form. It dis triggers the dissociation from the membrane. It allows then, and transport, it allows then docking to the outer leaflet of the inner membrane where this complex again dissociates, allowing the release of the bound phospholipids from, uh, from this lipid transfer protein. And this phospholipid can then be used for cardiolipin synthesis. Now this is just a cartoon, very simple. Uh, we think, for instance, that this PA transport does not occur via free diffusion of this lipid transfer protein. We favor much more the idea, like many other people in the field, that these lipid transfer proteins are actually closely located to membrane contact sites, so that re which basically reduce the distance between that needs to be, uh, or where lipid needs to be transported from the outer membrane to, to the inner membrane, making the process simply more efficient in vivo than in vitro. Okay. One point was very interesting to us that uh, we observed when doing this in vitro lipid transfer assays, and that was that when we added cardiolipin to the acceptor membrane, so the to receiving membrane, this cardiolipin seemingly inhibited the transport of phosphatidic acid. Mm. And that we found interesting because these are concentrations that you really find in vivo uh, under physiological conditions. The cardiolipin concentration is around 15% depending on that. So we looked at this in more detail, and it turns out that at, uh, at these physiological cardiolipin concentrations, this UPS protein cannot dissociate anymore from the acceptor liposomes, and basically the back transport is inhibited. And this, we think, is a very interesting observation if you think about the stability of these proteins, because maybe this actually serves as a kind of a sensor of the lipid concentration or cardiolipin concentration in the acceptor membrane. 
So we can at least envision that under low cardiolipin concentration, you have this transport, bidirectional transport in both directions. So UPS1 picks up PA, transport it to, uh, to the inner membrane, it's converted into cardiolipin, and then dissociates again, picks up the next PA, and basically boosts cardiolipin biosynthesis until the cardiolipin level in the inner membrane reaches a concentration that prevents the dissociation of UPS1 from the inner membrane. Now, under these conditions, because there's so much cardiolipin now in the inner membrane, this protein cannot dissociate anymore, and therefore it's degraded by the proteases huh? and limiting the PA transport. This is, I should really highlight that, this is a model that we have at the moment. There are clearly more experiments needed to support it, but at least it gives us an, a hypothesis how actually the sense may, may utilize such a lipid transfer protein to sense the concentration of a defined phospholipid in the uh, mitochondrial inner membrane. Now, this work was all done in yeast, but I just would like to emphasize that this process is highly conserved and occurs also in mammalian cells. So we looked in human cells, and this was work by Christoph Potting in the lab. Uh, human mitochondria contain homologs of all of these components. We have a UPS1 homolog is term Preli1, MDM35 homolog Tribe1, and he did biochemical experiments showing that we have exactly the same uh, reg uh, regolon here, the Preli protein is degraded, it's a substrate of this YME1 uh, protease, constantly degraded under these conditions, and you may remember I showed you yesterday, as I used this as an example for illustrating the knockout of YME1 because it always accumulates in all tissues. Uh, this, so this Preli protein is constantly degraded, only upon assembly with Tribe 1 it's stabilized against, against degradation, and this heterodimeric protein complex serves as a lipid transfer protein for, or in particular for phosphatidic acid. So we have exactly the same situation and the same regolon in, uh, in uh, yeast and in mammalian cells. And I should actually, I forgot to mention this, all of these components were identified in our screen, the yeast screen for prohibitants. They're all synthetic lethal for prohibitants. So this is all seems to be one functional regolon there. Okay, now in mammalian cells, I think this, we think this is interesting because one of these protein, uh, tribe 1, are actually P is P53 inducible. And we think that this is a, a very important response to preserve cardiolipin concentration in the mitochondrial inner membrane. Because as you may know, cardiolipin, one function of cardiolipin is to be an acceptor for, for cytochrome C. And it's therefore very important for a cell to keep cardiolipin concentration high to prevent the release of cytochrome C from the inner membrane and then finally from the mitochondria in case of the apoptotic uh, signaling is uh, increased. So we think that this lipid transfer protein, by preserving uh, the uh, cardiolipin concentration, protects the cells against apoptosis. And indeed, when we take away these lipid transfer proteins in knockout or knockouts or something, then these cells are much more susceptible to apoptosis and we can rescue it by providing simply more of the phospholipid. Uh, uh, to these cells. So this just highlights the physiological relevance of a defined lipid concentration. In this case, it's cardiolipin to protect against apoptosis. Okay. Uh, now, one point to switch gears a little bit here that was difficult for us to, uh, yeah, or made it more difficult for us to recognize that these proteins are a novel class of lipid transfer proteins is simply the fact that they did not show any sequence similarity with any known lipid transfer proteins. Huh? That was a bit puzzling, and therefore we were always interested to, uh, to solve the crystal structure of these lipid transfer proteins, and we were really fortunate that we were able to collaborate with Stephen Matthews at Imperial College in London, who actually worked on these proteins for completely different reasons. He was interested in P53 regulated genes, uh, and we actually teamed up, and they, and I should really uh, uh, say this is their structure, they solved it. They solved the crystal structure by NMR and, and X-ray crystal, uh, crystallography of a heterodimeric dimeric complex of tribe 1 and slow-mo 1, which is a homologue of UPN1, UPS1 in mammalian cells. And this is the structure uh, of this uh, heterodimeric lipid transfer protein. You see here this uh, slow-mo 1, which is UPS1 or Preli 1, 
and maybe I, have, I should say, UPS1 looks identical, I should say, because the group of Toshi Endo did this in parallel in yeast, uh, so I could also call it UPS1, you cannot distinguish it, uh, forms this anti-parallel seven-stranded anti-parallel beta sheet, which forms this kind of concave barrel that is then uh, closed by this diagonal uh, long helix there, and together with, in green shown here, the triable MDM35 protein, which forms, I come to that, uh, which basically together close this uh, cavity. I mean, the striking thing about this structure is that it is strikingly similar to known lipid transfer proteins, although there is no sequence homolo homology. Uh, I think it's really a striking example for convergent evolution here. And what, this is basically an overlay of these two structures, and they are literally uh, highly identical. You see here, uh, this is the helix that is here replaced, in this case in red, here by the MDM35, so the C-terminal helix in this uh, phosphatidyl inositol transfer proteins that contain a so-called start domain. is basically the C-terminal helix is replaced by MDM35 triab protein in the case of the heterodimeric. Uh, pro, uh, lipid transfer protein class. So we, and we think that this, and have some mutational, and I did some mutational analysis, that then phospholipids, in this case for, the, for UPS1, phosphatidic acid, basically bind in this cavity with the head group here, there are some charge interactions, and with the acyl chain having some hydrophobic interactions with this beta sheet. Huh? So it's a, it has a classical fo uh, this fold of a classical lipid transfer protein, there's no sequence, uh, similarity, but this is completely consistent what we see actually in our biochemical experiments. So we were really happy about that. Uh, I should say uh, this MDM35 has also quite interesting structure because it's this expected twin helical bundle and uh, this is typical for the so-called CX9C proteins. These are proteins that are oxidized in the intermembrane space of mitochondria by another uh, protein that is basically uh, termed MIA1 and this uh, structure of these two proteins, MIA1 and TRIAP, is really almost identical, with the exception of an internal extension, which is important for the function of MIA40 in this redox regulation. Mm -hmm. So this was all fine, and we have now can conclude from that. Now we have identified a new class of lipid transfer proteins. They transfer lipid phosphatidic acid from the outer membrane to the inner membrane to uh, allow uh, cardiolipin synthesis. This is just to wrap up what I've told you so far. So these are heterodimeric complexes, UPS1, MDM35, Preli1, Triab1, transfer of phosphatidic acids. We think this transfer occurs at contact sites, which basically facilitate the lipid exchange between both mitochondrial membrane. I showed you the reaction cycle association, dissociation of this complex, uh, the structural similarity, and this is a highly conserved protein family. Huh? Okay. Now, for the rest of the time, I thought I, I uh, uh, introduce you to some more recent work that we did, looking actually at the other uh, member of this protein family, and this is this UPS2 MDM35 complex. Remember, we, have, we started out identifying these genes here with UPS1 deletion affecting cardiolipin, whereas PE, uh, UPS2 deletion affecting phosphatidyl ethanolamine. Huh? So we, of course, wanted now to know, are also these heterodimeric complexes lipid, or do they serve, function as lipid transfer proteins in mitochondria? And of course, if you, all the work that we have done already, uh, ah, sorry, I should introduce you to that. So now, how can, how can UPS2 affect PE accumulation in membrane? What I didn't tell you so far is that besides cardiolipin, mitochondria also synthesize phosphatidyl ethanolamine in their membrane. And that, I think, is an a function of mitochondria that is often forgotten because PE is in fact a major constituent of all cellular membrane and PE synthesized from the mitochondria is actually exported from mitochondria and distributed in all cellular membranes. Now the relative contrib there are different PE synthesis pathways in the cell and the relative contribution of the mitochondrial PE synthesis varies a lot between different tissues and different organisms. In yeast, the mitochondrial PE is a major source of PE in, in, in the, for the whole cellular membrane. Huh? In mammals, it differs a lot between different tissues. Now, and how do they synthesize PE? Now, mitochondria do synthesize PE from precursor lipids that are again imported into mitochondria from the ER. In this case, this is phosphatidylserine that is synth synthesized in the ER 
tran transported from the ER across the outer membrane to the inner membrane. And in the inner membrane, there's a phosphatidylserine decarboxylase that decarboxylates phosphatidylserine, converts it into PE, which is then redistributed across uh, mitochondrial membranes, but can also be released from mitochondria and then by uh, uh, methylation basically converted into phosphatidylcholine, another major constituent of cellular membranes. So this is really an important function of mitochondria, depending on the organism you're looking at, because it is important for the synthesis of two major phospholipids, uh, membrane constituents of cellular membranes, PE and PC. But as I said, there are different P, uh, PE synthesis pathways in a cell, and it depends really on which cell you're looking at. Good. By the way, you see again here highlighted how many lipid trafficking events must occur between these membranes, and actually we hardly understand any of them. Actually, in this case, we don't understand a single one. Huh? So it's really unclear. Okay, so how can UPS2 and MDM35 affect the accumulation of PE in mitochondria? Now, it's an obvious idea that it somehow has something to do with this trafficking event. So we started out and actually purified heterodimeric complexes in vitro. This turned out to be a bit more complicated because these proteins contain cysteines, which makes it a bit more difficult to express. But we generated a variant uh, that basically could be expressed and we could purify heterodimeric protein complexes. And much to our satisfaction, it turns out that also these heterodimeric protein complexes serve as lipid transfer protein. However, they have a strikingly different substrate specificity. In this case, UPS2 and MDM35 are highly specific for phosphatidylserine, whereas other, uh, other phospholipids are not or hardly transported in vitro. Hmm? So we have now a UPS1 specific for phosphatidylic acid, UPS2 specific for phosphatidylserine. Hmm? Now, we also wanted to know what is the human uh, author log of that, and for that we used a yeast screen where we basically complemented by expressing the, the human autologs of uh, UPS2 in yeast cells uh, lacking yeast UPS2 and basically look for the suppression of the phenotype and as you can easily see expression of this, of this protein, SLOMO2, uh, restores growth as well as the, accum the accumulation of PE in UPS2 deficient yeast cells. Identifying clearly SLOMO2 as the uh, you, uh, also log of uh, yeast UPS2. And uh, SLOMO2 also forms a complex with triope in a heterodimeric complex, which acts like the yeast protein in phosphatidylserine transport. And this is basically shown here. This is a different essay now, but doesn't matter. It's fluorescence sequencing essay, where we look at the transfer uh, of NBDPS. And you see this protein, although less active, and the yeast protein is clearly able to specifically transfer phosphatidyl phosphatidylserine, but not phosphatidic acid in this essay. So we have another type of lipid transfer protein, UPS2 MDM35 SLOMO2 triap, that is in this case specific for UPS2 rather than for, UP, uh, for, 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 for the specific for phosphatidylserine rather than UPS1 that is specific for phosphatidic acid. Seems not now. Okay. Now. Of course, these were all in vitro experiments, and we wanted to really verify these results by in vivo experiments. Thus, do these proteins really act like PS transfer proteins in vivo? Now, this is a bit more difficult than you may think, and this is a scheme in yeast about, uh, on the different pathways for the synth that lead to the synthesis of PE, and it's really a nightmare. Huh? But this is why yeast is so beautiful to work with sometimes, uh, because you can really manipulate this genome now like crazy, even more like, uh, like uh, CRISPR -Cas, with CRISPR-Cas human cells. So we have a kind of a competition in the lab at the moment who deletes more genes in one uh, cell type, but the yeast people are clearly ahead. Uh, in this case, uh, we uh, basically deleted all non-mitochondrial pathways for PE synthesis. And I don't want to go in too much into detail. There's a PSD2 protein in the Golgi, and there is a, uh, a pathway that basically utilizes the head groups from sphingolipids for the synthesis of PE. We can basically delete these corresponding genes. We can also prevent the synthesis, de novo synthesis from, uh, from ethanolamine, of PE from ethanolamine or choline by just not providing this uh, ethanol to the growth medium. So we end up with cells where we deleted these proteins, don't add this, that can only synthesize PE 
along uh, in a PSD1 dependent manner. And that's actually the only thing you should understand here at that point. Huh? So we really look at yeast cells that only have these pathways, huh? nothing else. So any PE that we see is uh, generated by PSD1. Hmm? Good, when you delete them PSD1, it's lethal, the cell die. Hmm? Now, then Mari Alton and a PhD student in the lab actually did a labeling experiment now with the hope that if you delete UPS2, now the PE synthesis should really break down. Now when she did this, this is the result, she labeled the cells with, uh, with uh, ser radio labeled serine, and the result was rather disappointing. Because when she looked at the accumulation of PE and all, uh, also PC, which is actually gener just generated then from PC, so it's all PC that is there, newly is also synthesized by PSD1, it was completely normal. Huh? And that was really a bit disappointing. This is a quantification. There was really absolutely no difference in the accumulation of PC in these cells and uh, only a minor decrease in the synthesis of P in these cells. Now that was really now a problem for us and start us make thinking, how can this be? We have here a lipid transfer protein that clearly synthesizes PS in the, uh, transfers PS in vitro. PS is required for PSD1 to convert it into PE. Uh, so how can this be that this, is there another lipid transfer protein? How can this be? Now, one idea we came up with is actually outlined here. So maybe the following happens in these cells. Now, PSD1 is an enzyme that actually resides in the mitochondrial inner membrane. It has a membrane anchor. It's anchored to the inner membrane by a uh, one transmembrane region and exposes the catalytic domain to the intermembrane space. Maybe it's a bit of a strange idea, but maybe PSD1 actually is able to act in trans and decarboxylate phosphatidyl ethanolamine in, uh, or, uh, when it is still in the outer membrane. Huh? And therefore, you, you would not need to have this UPS2 MDM35 dependent transfer of PS to the inner membrane. So this model would predict that we have basically two pathways, uh, how PE can be synthesized within mitochondria by PSD1. One pathway that is UPS2 MDM35 dependent and depends on lipid transfer between both membranes. And one pathway that depends on the transaction of an inner membrane and of PSD1 localized in the inner membrane at the outer membrane. Now, can this be the case? Now, to, to test this possibility, uh, Takashi Tatsuza in the lab actually set up an in vitro assay to prove or to, to test whether PSD1 is in, in vitro in, in, uh, able to decarboxylate phosphatidyl serine to PE in a bilayer that is just in juxtaposition. Now what he did is the following. So he basically synthesized PSD1 in a cell-free system. We use an E. coli system for that in the presence of liposomes. And this resulted in the insertion of PSD1 into the liposomes. And there are some ways to test the activity of PSD1 in these liposomes. There is an autocatalytic cleavage, don't want to go into any detail. So we were very, very confident that this PSD1 is really catalytically active. Now then he purified these proteoliposomes by a, a flotation gradient and then incubated with these uh, proteoliposomes containing reconstituted PSD1 with liposomes that contain PS. And I should forgot to mention, but these liposomes, of course, did not contain any PE or PS. So the only PS that was provided to these uh, uh, reconstituted PSD1 molecule was provided in trans by these liposomes uh, that were mixed with these uh, proteoliposomes. And then we purified these and analyzed this by mass spec. And what uh, he found is actually summarized here. Indeed, he sees a time-dependent accumulation of PE by these uh, PSD1 molecule in trans. And we did many controls to really convince ourselves. One is, for instance, that you just inactivate PSD1. So it's really depending on the catalytic activity of PSD1. We can exclude uh, the fusion of the liposomes during this reaction. So we are very confident from this assay, which is a purely in vitro assay, that PSD1 can actually decarboxylate phosphatidyl uh, serine uh, to phosphatidyl ethanolamine in a lipid bilayer that is actually uh, provided in trans huh, to this membrane. So this would be at least consistent with our model. Now another prediction of our model is, so this seems to be not completely off. Huh? 
So another prediction of this model is that if this molecule acts in trans, it must be critical that it can reach the outer membrane. So the spatial arrangement between the inner and outer membrane should be very critical. If this is the case, then it would be really interesting to see because it could be a very general principle that inner membrane proteins can actually act in trans as long as the inner membrane is really in close juxtaposition to the outer membrane. Now, how can we test this possibility? Now, this actually made us getting interested in a protein complex that was actually in, in recently identified in three labs independently uh, uh, of each other in Walter Neupers, Jordan Aris, and Nicolas Panner's lab uh, in Germany there, that uh, uh, they identified a heterooligomeric protein complex that they called the membrane membrane contact site and crystal organizing system, MICOS, huh, which basically sits in the inner membrane and is basically important for the ultrastructure of mitochondria and for uh, the alignment of the inner and outer membrane. That's a rather complex molecule and there's intense uh, research going on on this molecule and they, these complexes are thought to sit on these Christi junctions, so these are these invaginations where the Christi are formed and there are also interactions with the outer membrane that maybe preserve the uh, arrangement of these two membranes with each other. So we thought if this is, uh, uh, if we basically look in cells that lack mucos complexes, we disrupt the ultrastructure of mitochondria and that should somehow have affect the ability of PSD1 to act in trans. Hmm? So this we did and in Jody's lab actually they generated a strain that Jonathan Friedman in her lab who basically lack all these core micro subunits, huh? so all six genes. So we have now a yeast strain with six genes, and we then looked at these strains and deleted two more genes in these strains, uh, just to, again, get rid of the non-mitochondrial uh, pathways for PE synthesis. And then Mari actually again labeled uh, phospholipids in these cells, and she was really happy when she found that in these cells now, the synthesis of PE was impaired, and in particular the accumulation of PC was impaired. Hmm? And this is I think again a quantification, so you see here the PC accumulation was completely impaired in a mucos dependent manner, whereas she saw, in fact, relative, in re when she plotted it relatively, an accumulation of PC in these cells. Now this told us that these contact sites between the inner and outer membrane are somehow important for the efflux of PE and its conversion in PC in the endoplasmatic reticulum. So the ultrastructure of mitochondria seem to be indeed important for PSD1 to, to allow PSD1 to synthesize, uh, to decarboxylate PE and uh, PS to PE and convert it into PC. So this is the model we are actually proposing on these and other experiments. And that is that there are basically, or the key of this model is that there are two independent pathways for the synthesis of PE in mitochondria. There is one pathway that depends on PS-specific lipid transfer proteins, UPS2 and M35, or SLOMO2 tribe 1 uh, in human mitochondria. This allows PS, uh, PSD1 in the inner membrane to convert PS into PE. However, there is a second route that does not depend on these lipid transfer proteins, but it depends on mucos complexes and on the structural arrangement of mitochondria, and this allows the decarboxylation of PS to PE in the, directly in the outer membrane and its conversion into PC. Now, uh, maybe if you give me five more minutes, I would actually allude to a, another aspect of this work that we were actually prompted to look at when we said, because this work then for the first time linked uh, these contact site complexes to the mitochondrial phospholipid metabolism. So apparently the arrangement of this membrane is very important to, uh, or the conformation of these contact sites is very important for allowing lipid synthesis to occur uh, in these cells. Now, we therefore thought maybe what is actually the uh, yeah, I should start differently. So can we basically substantiate this role of mucos in this phospholipid in more, by a few more experiments? And this is just one piece of evidence, where we, which is basic genetic evidence, when you basically delete this non-mitochondrial PE synthesis pathway that's indicated here by this double delta in mucos deficient cells, then they, they basically show a strong synthetic growth defect which is completely consistent with the function of PE, uh, of mucos in this PE synthesis pathway. And we can suppress this phenotype by simply providing ethanolamine as an oxytroph. Uh, 
in the, uh, to these yeast cells. No? Uh, another experiment that we did to substantiate this role of mycos in the, in this, for this phospholipid trend is using artificial tetra protein. Now this is a bit tricky to do, but what we did here is uh, we basically designed an artificial protein that contained on uh, inner membrane, transmembrane region, a, a spacer region of 12 amino acid, and then a transmembrane region in the outer membrane in a GFP fusion protein, and we could express it in these cells, and we were very happy to see that the expression of this tetra restored the growth or deficiency of mycos, de uh, of mycos deficient cells. Uh, that were basically grown at 37 degrees. I should highlight that this theta, it, is, it looks very clear for this phenotype, but there are many phenotypes associated with the delta mycos, in, or with the loss of mycos complexes in the cells. And one is, for instance, that these cells lose respiratory activity, and this is not suppressed at all by this theta. So we think that this artificial theta is a partial uh, partially suppresses functions of mycos complexes, but it seems to pre uh, suppress the functions that are linked to the PE metabolism. This also tells us that it's not all about PE metabolism in these mycos deficient cells, which made the mycos field a bit more happier, I think. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so I think these experiments somehow substantiate this model that we would actually like to propose. But they're also brought us, made us more thinking which of the functions of mycos are actually really associated with this PE metabolism. And here we looked actually uh, at the at cells lacking not only a mycos subunit, but also the lipid transfer protein. No? So in this case, now we, we basically interfered with lipid transfer and did this in mycos deficient cells. And we were really surprised to see that in this case, the loss of UPS2 proteins, the lipid transfer protein, completely restored the respiratory growth of these cells. And maybe more impressive, when we look at the ultrastructure of mitochondria, we also have a dramatic suppressive effect. And you may not see this so clearly in the wild type situation, but when we look at cells that lack central mycos subunits, like here MIG10 or uh, MIG10 or here MIG60, they show a completely aberrant crystal structure, huh? very typical. And by simply by deleting this lipid transfer protein, that is a lipid transfer protein for PS, we could completely suppress this phenotype in these yeast cells. Huh? So apparently these subtle changes of phospholipids in the mitochondrial inner membrane can have very profound effects on the ultrastructure of mitochondria. And this is actually the last bottom, or the last conclusion I would actually like you to pick up. And this is really this fact that the lipid composition of a membrane has a very, really profound effect on the ultrastructure and the structural arrangement of mitochondrial membranes, and this we confirmed by lipidomics. We do see only subtle changes in these mycos deficient cells, but, we, this but these can be in implemented also by deletion of UPS2, and therefore we think that the decrease of PE levels by deleting of UPS2 in delta mycos cells basically restores the ultrastructure in these cells. And this is actually also supported by some previous studies that we did where we looked at cardiolipin synthesis mutant. Doesn't really matter what it is, or actually maybe it matters. It's, it's a PG synthase, which is a central step in the synthesis of cardiolipin. Also these mitochondria are completely distorted and show aberrant crystal morphology. And also in this case, by simply deleting, in this case, the uh, lipid transfer protein for the precursor protein, uh, precursor lipid phosphatidic acid, we could completely suppress this phenotype. And in this case, we were, uh, could actually show that Basically, by deleting this lipid transfer protein, we prevent the accumulation of PA and CDP duct in the inner membrane. And this are really is a very low percentile. So we're talking about below 1%. Huh? Still, it has this profound effect on, uh, on the lipid composition. So this made us believe now that we have to think much more about lipid composition when we think about mitochondrial structure and ultrastructure. Now, with this, actually, I would just like to leave, conclude with this slide, which tries to wrap up all what I have told you today, uh, at least in the second part. So I've introduced you to this new class of lipid transfer proteins. UPS1 MDM35 is a lipid transfer protein for phosphatidic acid, affects cardiolipin synthesis. And in the second part, UPS2 MDM35 is a lipid transfer protein for phosphatidylserine. Now, 
uh, there are two pathways leading to the formation of phosphatidyl acenolamine in the inner membrane, a UPS2 MDM35 dependent pathway and a MECOS dependent pathway. And this is central for the conversion of PE, its export of PE and its conversion into PC in the endoplasmatic reticulum. And at the end, I've just highlighted that this lipid composition is a very important determinant for the ultrastructure of mitochondria and subtle changes in the lipid con uh, uh, composition can have profound effect. So for instance, in mucose deficient cells, we see that a subtle decrease of the PE accumulation, as we think in the mitochondrial inner membrane, by deleting UPS2 completely restores the uh, normal crystal or uh, morphology in these mucose deficient cells. Now with, th with this, I'm at my end. Thank you, but most importantly, also thank co-workers involved in this. And for the second part, this was really uh, the work of Mari Altonen and Takashi Tatsuta, a long-year co-worker in the lab. The, uh, it's built on a lot of work of previous members on the lab that are basically now all over the place, uh, who basically Melanie and Matthias and Takashi were really instrumental in identifying uh, UPS1 as lipid transfer proteins and Christoph actually started the whole endeavor in the lipid metabolism. And the crystal structure we did together with Stephen Matthews, I should say, he did the crystal structure. Uh, and Jody provided us, uh, lab provided us with the delta micro strains, and uh, Jean Paul and Benedict did some EM for us. Thank you very much. Well, you can only correlate it, but it correlates with respiratory deficiency. In this mucose cells, so if you basically restore the normal Christi morphology, also suppress respiration. So it completely uh, goes with the function, but I wouldn't go so far that I really see it's correlated. Yeah, yeah, but it definitely correlates with that. So that's a clear correlation between that. Yeah, it is interestingly enough. And uh, so we made different lengths. And actually, we see almost exclusively a suppression with a 12 amino acid linker, not with a 14 and not with a 10. Uh, so this is really striking. I mean, we only see that. I don't know what, I mean, you can now make you know, length estimation, what, what basically maybe, what do you need to, what is the size of the domain of PSD1? Very difficult, but that's what we observe. So there is definitely a length dependence and works best with a 12 amino acid long spacer. Hmm? Yeah. Does the outer mitochondrial membrane have another way to get PE other than through this method you're talking about, basically to, to so under normal conditions, uh, I think there are different ways because the PE is synthesized outside uh, mitochondria, right. and then it can be imported from the ER, depending on the cell type you're looking at, it's more or less. Uh, under the conditions where we looked, where we basically, uh, it can only come from PSD1, because in these cells it can only be generated from PSD1. And you may have noticed that in this delta micro cell, we see, uh, we see a complete block of PC synthesis, whereas PE accumulates, and we think this is because PE is transported by UPS2 into the inner membrane and accumulates there. You cannot get out of it, basically, like a kind of a sink of that. Hmm? So this, the second one we haven't looked at, but we surely will do. Uh, the first one I can say a clear yes. So there's clear requirement of defined phospholipids for fusion. That's work of several labs. Michael Froman's lab showed that you need phosphatidic acid for fusion. There are some data from Hiromi Sizaki's lab that you need also phosphatidic acid for fission. So there is uh, a clear requirement, and you need cardiolipin at many stages for the oligomerization of OPA1, for instance, MGM1 in yeast. So these phospholipids play a crucial role for fusion and fission. And this is what you would expect because of their biophysical properties. And this is clearly the case. But whether they activate the pathway I was talking about yesterday, 
uh, we haven't looked. Because in yeast it doesn't exist, and this was mainly done in yeast. Uh, in the mammals, we are about to look at it, but we haven't. Mm. Do you think Indian 45 has other partners that are We tried to look into that, but didn't find them. Uh, but I think yes, huh? because the phenotype is bit different than the, uh, than the phenotype of the other protein. There should be definitely other binding partners. There are some yeast-specific proteins there, and we looked in yeast, uh, that I think are candidates for that. But whether they are lipid transfer proteins, I would not, I don't know. We, we don't know. I mean, again, there are no sequence similarity with anything. As this is an example, it doesn't mean too much, but uh, yeah. Mm? But it could well be that there are more binding partners. Actually, I would expect. So there have been proteomic studies where people looked at the distribution of pro inner membrane proteins in a, on a sucrose gradient, just where you have different densities of the different membranes. And from these studies, it looked, from these biochemical studies, that PSD1 was localized close to the membrane contact sites that were later shown to be formed by uh, or dependent on mycos complexes. No? In that sense, I would expect that PSD1 is close to contact sites, which would also make sense if you think about that this is likely the site where the phospholipid transfer occurs. But really, uh, hard data confirming that have not been done now in yeast, and people, including us, also look now in mammalian cells where these proteins are really localized to, to see uh, yeah, whether it's really there and whether this is basically a hub where you have the transfer process occurring and at the same time, as these data suggest, allowing the trans activity of this PSD1 in the outer membrane. But it is actually a prediction we would make hmm, based on the available data and according to this, this data. Hmm. Well, I think this is a well. This is a very good question, <laughs> and I mean, there's a lot of discussion about it. Why has it evolved that you have PSD1 in the inner membrane, and why do you have this strange pathway? And I mean, the one can speculate in one way or the other, but the answer is simply we don't know no? whether this is really why this has evolved like this. May have evolutionary, simply evolutionary reasons. Uh, but why this has been maintained as the only enzyme sitting there uh, is still not clear. Let's put it like this. It's really, yeah. But it's really the only enzyme there. Good. Okay, with that, let's thank Thomas for two great lectures. Thank you very much.